Hello, folks, and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. I'm your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, is Phil McKenzie. Yo. Oh, that was quick. I was actually going to say and pause and expect you to reply after that. You you anticipated the pause. Yeah, I just got in there fast You're this time. Just uh, trying I to always make want to me... keep you on your toes. So, so does this reveal that the entire time, dead air Phil has just been laziness? You could have been replying very quickly all along. Yes. <laughs> and thank God we've got another person on the show today, not just this asshole. We are very happy to be joined by Ryan Wagner. <laughs> Ryan? Hey guys, how's it going? I'm happy to be back on the show. We are very happy to have you. And let me just say, it's so refreshing to hear Phil's dulcet English tones. I had to make do with Kyle for the longest time, and let me tell you, a yeah. pale imitation. Yeah, not a nice accent in it. No. Um, <laughs> so... Um, yeah, we've got uh, UFC 285 on the docket, fellas, and uh, that is why we brought Ryan in. He's, as you can tell already just by the words you've heard, he he just has, um, his voice just sort of radiates radiates enthusiasm. Yep, that's me. And energy, and um, that I think is more or less the same sort of vibe we can expect from John Jones, who uh, <laughs> was on a real tear. Absolutely crushing all of his opponents, all of whom were just as good as the guys he was beating in his run to the title, and um, and took a brief hiatus and gained about 40 pounds, some of it muscle, and is now finally, supposedly, making his heavyweight debut. So my question is, um, what do you guys think about Cyril Gaon versus Sergei Pavlovich? <laughs> Uh, one of the greatest and most enticing fights I've ever heard of being booked. Uh, just, uh, just an, in, just an enticing level of like skill, athleticism, everything else. I mean, I, until you mentioned it at this moment, I didn't know how badly I wanted it. That is the, in case you weren't aware, that is the official stand in, in case, God forbid, mm-hmm. something unpredictable happens to John Jones in the lead up to the thing that he clearly doesn't want to happen. Um, so we, we could honestly have this episode talking about Jones gone and end up watching. I mean, especially after last week, main event canceled hours before it was supposed to happen. Uh, so who knows? There's a, there's an energy in the air. Things are spiraling. Everything's coming to a head. It's impossible to say what that head may be, but. I suppose we have to talk about John Jones as if he is actually going to fight, even though we all know he isn't. Um, Ryan, you're our guest. How good is John Jones going to look? Um, how good is he going to look? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> when people think about this fight, you, when you hear people talking like online and in the media, it seems like they're kind of expecting 2014 John Jones to fight Cyril Gaon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I rewatched Jones's fight with Reyes recently to like write notes about what he does well, so I could talk about them. There, there weren't really any notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's he's incredibly durable, and he doesn't stop coming. Like if you if you take the back foot and let him walk forward, he will keep coming and tanking your offense. Yeah. Uh, he's decent defensively still. He can see things coming, uh, and his long guard is kind of tricky to figure out if you're not a great boxer. Or if you're shorter than him, uh, so and it might sound like I'm being kind of dismissive. Like his skills have obviously eroded a huge deal. He's not a great striker anymore, and he can't seem to wrestle at all. But for heavyweights and light heavyweights, if you have a guy just constantly walking you down over and over again, he won't stop. You can't dissuade him, uh, and you're not seeming to hurt him with your best offense. That can be seriously demotivating, and it can gas guys out quickly absolutely so that's kind of his biggest the biggest thing going for him right now he's kind of a shitty terminator that follows you around no matter what you're doing (laughs) just tanking your offense until you get tired and then he can do his pot shotting thing it's like you're running as fast as you can and you look back and jason is slowly walking behind you and then he like trips over a roller skate but he gets back (laughs) up (laughs) he keeps keeps coming exactly (laughs) um yeah He's he, you know, I mean, I I think those would be honestly overwhelming advantages against most heavyweights not named Cyril Gaon. Yeah. 
which I suppose does make this fight more interesting than any other heavyweight bout Jones could have taken. Because no doubt they would all be similarly ugly fights. I'm not expecting a blistering pace. I don't know that any, uh, I suspect neither of you guys are either. Um, but Cyril Gaon is not a guy who can't like keep moving and more or less match that slow pace and make Jones continually have to reset and find his targets. So if you look at Jones versus like first round Tiago Santos before his knee exploded and then honestly, Tiago into the third round until those problems continued to compound. Um, it didn't look good. It didn't look like he knew what to do. Um, so I don't know, Phil. Like, what is your what, what, what's your what's your take on John Jones's, to my eyes, very apparent decline over the last four or five defenses of his light heavyweight title run? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the like, uh, plodding after people and tanking damage thing is at least partially a result of the fight that, um, the fights that, uh, Santos and Reyes wanted to have with John Jones. Cause I think he's actually much better. Uh, I think he's actually much better off the back foot. I think he's an okay. Um, he's an okay back foot fighter at this point. And that's because everyone he's fought has basically been coming forward on him. Uh, he's built all the, he's built a style for like diffusing pressure. So like his fight against Gustafsson or even did like his second fight against Cormier, even though this is, you know, you, probably one of the last times he actually looked, uh, good but i mean those are fights where he's basically constantly drawing the opponent on like turning them like using them turning to hide his stance changes attacking the body and so on and so forth but once he's forced to come forward as he was against reyes and santos uh he's pretty dismal he just like uh starts just wading forward like losing his stance uh he has to rely on his own terrible like He's a, I think he's still, he can be a mechanically good boxer, a mechanically okay boxer on the counter, like when he's drawing people onto his shots, but like yeah. when he's coming forward, it's, it's real bad. Um, yeah. So I think the question with this one is like, is gone, I don't think is gone going to draw him on like Santos and, and, uh, Reyes did, or is he going to like try and pressure or is he just going to have like a broadly, neutral engagement and i think it's probably going to be the second one they're probably i think garn and jones will probably concede to, to essentially the same range mm-hmm. uh where they will like poke away at each other and um you know probably the physical attributes of of either one of them will tend to win out and so i mean my general take is like Gone has not looked particularly great as like a defensive wrestler, mm-hmm. aside from the fact that he's just, you know, he's just big and athletic, um, and you know, up against someone equally as big and athletic in uh, Francis Ngannou, he he got taken down a couple of times, um, but that's probably not going to matter. Uh, I mean, I've been banging the drum that Jones can't offensively wrestle anymore for a very long time. Yeah, what is the deal uh, with that, though? I want to hear, like, I want some explanation as to why Jones, like, it's not even that he, a lot of the time it is that he doesn't try to wrestle. So you could be forgiven for thinking that he's just, like, fallen out of love with it. Mm-hmm. But there are enough instances of him trying to note that the attempts just aren't good anymore. What, it what is changed? very strange. Um, so his shot has never been good. Uh, he would hit it due to like speed, athleticism, and timing. Sometimes, like he he shot um, a really low double leg on Ryan Bader, and it was yeah, super messy. Yeah, I remember messy. thinking that was. I remember thinking like that worked really well. Yeah, it was really messy, but he caught him stepping back at the right time, and it was fast. And he scrambled up to it well, up to the finish. Uh, nowadays, it's slower and more predictable, and the the bad mechanics of it are mattering more. Uh, when he like shoots down and kills his own positioning with his knees down and his back rounded. Yeah. Now he's not able to rely on that athleticism to just get him over the hump and guys can just uh, push down on the head or step away and defend it without a problem. Yeah. The biggest thing is that he's somehow just lost all his upper body wrestling. And I don't have a good explanation for that. He can't even seem to hold guys in the clinch anymore. Mm-hmm. Like in the Reyes fight, uh, 
a lot of times he would just kind of back away and let Reyes out. But even when he tried to hold him, Reyes didn't really have a problem like fighting off his wrist control or using a collar tie uh, to escape the, the cage. Even against I, Anthony Smith. I don't Smith, know what it is. You just can't do it anymore. Even against I mean, Anthony uh, Smith, he was shockingly passive in the clinches. Yeah. Which used to be like this terror zone for John Jones. And Phil has pointed out many times that one of like the functional problems for Jones is that he doesn't have good tools for getting to the clinches. But everyone can agree that when he does get them, he's, he, he can be pretty nasty there. And yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, just, I think Ed, Ed Gallo uh, pointed out that like, Jones started using, uh, like, more. He, he started, u- like, moving towards, like, single and double collar ties yeah. and, like, essentially the, you know, more tie of a, clinch a striking system, clinch. Rather than, like. Be careful, his... be careful what you call a tie clinch. Yeah, <laughs> Remember yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who we have on the show right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that he essentially basically got stuck in the halfway house. Um, but I think it's also, yeah, just that, like, so much of his game got ended up being built around the idea that um that like uh his opponents were going to make like the first two offensive options that um yeah i just think he's is all his ability to create offense of his own accord is outside of like you know poking away with oblique kicks and like uh and eye pokes and so on has has just eroded this is kind of my read, actually, that, that latter point there. That, like, what stands out to me most about Jones' recent fights is, I mean, this is a thing that happens to pretty much every fighter if they, if they stay in the game long enough to get old, is that I just don't think he pulls the trigger well anymore. He just seems to hesitate and overthink a lot more than he used to. And this stands out in the striking. I mean... This is also a common um, sort of progression for older fighters who has, who start to hesitate later in their careers is that they get beaten up some. They get shaken out of, like, their thinking. They go back to their instincts as the fight goes on, and they get more active. And this has definitely happened in Joe's, Jones's last few fights where he has started really, really slow and then usually is kind of crushing the opponent by the end when they're a little tired, but he's also just a lot more active. It happened against Santos, against Smith, uh, and against Reyes. But the the thing is, it's it, I don't think it's just the striking. I think even in the clinches, he sort of has the same inability to pull the trigger problem. Yeah, Where he gets to these positions. He'll get his um because I think Ed Ed made a good point with that. But you still see like in the Smith fight, Jones is getting um to those like wrist ties that he uses to set up all the great elbows. Um, he's getting good head position, um, and then he's just sort of like doesn't seem like he sh- knows what to do. He doesn't feel the opening for the strike quickly enough to seize on it, and so you see a lot more of him just sort of letting the clinch go, or like thinking, "Oh, I used to do spinning elbows on people, and like doing a very slow spinning elbow that doesn't land anymore." Um. And that was already always kind of an awkward strike to set up that worked because there was so much other shit to worry about in the clinch. And now it's like just the special moves remain and none of the connective tissue that that makes the clinch such an uncomfortable place that these openings just present themselves over and over again. Yeah, and the connective tissue is what made it so good. Like in the yeah. Reyes fight, when he would just kind of control Reyes' wrists and sit there, it's easy to get out of that. Like you, You're not going to keep a good guy there for very long. Yeah. What he was doing before is he would control your wrists and then he would like try to pin them to the cage and shoot a double leg or you would have to worry about him coming over the top with an elbow. And when he did one of those things, he would use your reaction to it to get to another good control position he can use. He yeah. would like elbow and then swim that elbowing arm to inside bicep control or something. Yeah. But now with when you don't have to think about all those threats, Jones just holding you there isn't that threatening because he's never been like a devastating underhook control guy like Cain Velasquez where they right. pin you to the cage and you just can't escape. Jones mm-hmm. has always been about working in transition and using strikes to prevent you from focusing on like your defensive reactions or focusing on like getting out mm-hmm. and using your reactions to improve his control without that the ability to actually force those transitions. His control is a lot less effective. Yeah. That that to me is the real defining issue is that Jones just has gotten 
it's gotten much harder for him to set anything up because he is slower both physically and mentally. And mm-hmm. and yeah. yeah, gets to good positions and just doesn't exploit them immediately like he used to do so very well. And like I said, you can see this um this hesitancy erode as most of these fights go on. Because one thing that's always been great about Jones' striking, much as I have never liked a lot of his mechanics, is he does one thing I'm constantly begging other fighters to do, which is he just takes absolutely whatever opening you present. He, he, he strikes attacks at all levels all the time. And when you get to the fourth round of one of these tepid, uninteresting fights, you will see people start to crumble because of that. He's kicking their legs with like three different types of kicks. He's poking them in the body with teeps and straight punches. He is jabbing them. He's throwing just the most hideous overhands you've ever seen. Um, and occasionally a really good straight, straight punch that makes you wonder why he doesn't throw those more often. But it is the, the combination of all these threats that makes Jones difficult to deal with and makes his reach such a, uh, such a deadly factor. And at a slower pace, um, he just doesn't look like a very good fighter. It's just that yeah. he doesn't go away. And so he lasts to a point where he can sort of, you know, sort of recapture a little old John Jones. That um, Yeah. So that that's my basic read on the fight, is that, like, I've been, again, banging the drum that John Jones can't, can't wrestle for, like, a super long time, including... You know the well, the uh, the Santos fight where uh, you know I, I picked against him, and people were like you know are you and you were right, you know this guy you were right. basically, <laughs> and this guy and and, and people were like you know this guy got got submitted by Eric Spicely. Are you telling me that John Jones is now a worse offensive wrestling threat than and wrestling and grappling threat than like Eric Spicely and David Branch? And I was like, yes, I'm saying that. <laughs> I'm picking it. That's my pick, and it was and it was true. <laughs> like he's worse than Eric Spicey and David Branch as an offensive rest, as an offensive grappling threat. But so I mean I think that's so when we're talking about the modern narrative though, there's still that I think essentially people are vastly overplaying the chance of uh, John Jones out wrestling Cyril Garn. And I'm not saying that like there's nothing crazy going to happen because it's an MMA fight and crazy he's, things happen. He's got to try you know, like, it, I mean, right? It's a heavyweight MMA fight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. But also, you know, Cyril Garn not known for his incredible like grappling choices. But I mean, stuff just happens. You know, Adesanya, um, Pajera, like we said beforehand, something weird might happen. And something weird did happen. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Pereira just spent an entire round on his on his back after doing something really dumb. Like, if something weird happens and Cyril Garn gets like submitted trying to get up in a strange way or whatever, I'll be completely unsurprised. Like, John Jones is has been doing this for a very long time. Uh, he is or was at one point like actually quite a, a nasty submission threat. If something weird happens, I'll be. Uh, I will not be surprised. I will be surprised if John Jones comes out, actively tries to enforce a wrestling game that Cyril Garn is trying to stop, and just like has success with it because it hasn't worked on people who are uh, just smaller and equally bad as wrestlers. And Garn has looked pretty competent in the clinch, I think. Uh, yeah, like shots you can get him down with that, but Jones can't shoot anymore, and his clinch positioning is not amazing, but it's pretty solid. He knows mm-hmm. like how to control inside the biceps. He knows how to use collar ties. He's not presenting any extremely clear and easy openings. And he also has a good feel for clinch offense. So I don't expect either of those routes to really be open for Jones. Unless, like you said, gone could something crazy could happen. He could slip on a kick. Jones could catch a kick. He mm-hmm. could try to go for a heel hook or something like that. Cause zero gone will do that. Yeah. Yep. And, but and, and I don't Jones, expect Jones to have any consistent path wrestling. Jones will Jeff- catch kicks for sure. Yeah. yeah. But generally, I think people are un- are massively overselling Jones's chances as a wrestler and are un- underselling his chances in a stinky kickboxing match. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because John Jones is uh, sorry, Cyril Garn is an an okay kickboxer, but like there's not that much there. 
Yeah. I mean, so for example, like uh, Garn against Volkov, I think is the one we look at here, right? It's two big tall guys. This was sort of Garn's test of like, are you actually a genuinely, are you actually a genuine elite heavyweight? Um, and he proved that he was, but the margins were not actually as wide as they as they kind of appeared. You know, he won the the fight fairly convincingly, but so much of it was just made from the fact that they were. It was quite close exchanges that we were having. He was having with Volkov that he was coming out on top of because Volkov is you know just glacially slow, and that it was fought at a pace that it was fought at just this kind of simmer of a pace. You know, all John Jones has to do is be a bit faster, a bit more defensively savvy than Volkov, and fight at a slightly higher pace than the one in that fight. And we're starting to get into very dicey territory. Hmm. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from on that. I'm not so worried about Gon, uh, like losing the distance fencing match. I think he has a couple advantages over Jones there. Um, that'll make it so he's probably winning rounds at least while he's like still in good shape uh his jab is pretty sharp and that it'll be really nice for him to have a low commitment option to needle jones with uh, a lot most of jones opponents have to exert a lot of energy to charge onto him mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that allows him to set up his most devastating offense but gone should be able to comfortably pick at him at range with that gone is also a lot better at defending kicks than jones um he's pretty uh, diligent about checking inside leg kicks and even body kicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if he can force an open stance fight, which I think he probably will look to do here or should, um, it can nullify a lot of Jones's offense where he's kicking into the bladed stance uh, with his rear leg and gone can check the body kicks. And that'll kind of leave Jones with, he's, he's probably not going to take the chance of like boxing on the lead against gone. So he'll probably be limited to, less effectual outside leg kicks. I also think there's probably a good chance Gon has some kind of consistent counter for the linear kicks. He just seems like the kind of guy that I'll like think about stuff like that. He likes to try tricky footwork things. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's either prepared to check them or pull off like some of those switching counters where you draw mm-hmm. your leg back and then counter with a kick. Yep. The thing that worries me most for Gon here is that I ex- well, I expect him to be winning rounds and banking time against Jones early. He, he could easily fall into like the durability trap yep. where Jones is, he's probably not going to have a lot of time, a really hard time kicking him clean. He'll probably be able to box him up a little bit. And it's easy to see him thinking, oh, wow, it was super easy to just boot his leg or his body. I should do that over and over again. I can kick him really hard because then he will get hurt and go away. And Jones very well might not get hurt and go away. And if Gon invests a lot into like uh, like hard offense that takes a lot of energy and Jones is still there, then there's a good chance that he can get tired late and Jones can uh, come on strong. Gon, I also want to point out, though, is perfectly happy having a stinker where he just jabs you up yeah. and throws little kicks. So I, I think he very well chooses, not fall into that. chooses the moments when he's going to sell out pretty carefully. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, the opponent has to be visibly on their last legs, I think, for him to go for it. I mean, I I can't tell you how much I would love to see Gon actually hurt Jones. And then go mm-hmm. for a, a Cyril Gon classic finishing sequence and see just what the hell happens. <laughs> just, just flailing away yeah. at Jones's brain, uh, Jones's brainstem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, Donkey Kong punches. Yeah, JDS is just watching and seething, simmering with rage. Um, That's how you beat the long guard. You come over the top to the back of the head with a hammer fist. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, I I think it's far more likely that Gon is perfectly content to have a pretty measured pace. Yeah. Uh, like he did against Volkov. Like, like Phil said, a big dude who, you know, was largely able to like touch him, um, at the range where he was trying to do work. And yeah, he just kind of held on to a slim but distinct advantage for five rounds. He was also willing against Volkov. And I don't know how often he did this because I couldn't bear watching the fight. I just checked out highlights, but. <laughs> But he he tried 
experimenting with some like longer combos and shifting combinations. Yeah. And they were kind of sloppy, but they worked. And if he does that against Jones, it'll probably work there too. And it could allow him to get like some big clean scores that Jones probably can't take back. Because if Jones is winning minutes, it'll be through that kind of consistent light output. He's probably not going to shot gone with anything big. Yeah. Yeah, anything past the jab for Cyril Gaon in a in a boxing combination is trash. Like, let's be clear about that. He okay. has a great jab, and it does not do half the things a jab is supposed to do. Like, you know, set up, put you in the right distance where you can then follow up with another punch that doesn't immediately throw you off balance or whatever. Like, the, the form falls apart very quickly. Um, But, uh, yeah, like, I guess the question is, like, now that it's what four years or more since the Tiago Santos fight, three? How long has it been since that fight? Must be at least three years. Yeah, that was in twenty nineteen, July of twenty nineteen. Wow. So, uh, yeah, now that it's been uh, so long since that, like a lot of what you're describing is Tiago Santos, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> moves around, throws lots of kicks, and when Jones comes in, is like willing to just like throw back and throw a bunch of sloppy shit at him. Which yeah, except the kicks are a lot sharper and better. The and kicks more are sharper, yeah. and he can j- and he can jab, and he's just bigger. Yeah, yeah. So the only thing I'm unclear on is that I'm I'm, you know, the psychological angle of this for John Jones. That to me is the most interesting thing. Is John Jones's psychology is a is a an endlessly fascinating subject. And um, I, I got to wonder, like, I'm not convinced that he's not going to try to wrestle right away. Like, it really seems like it would be an obvious thing to do. Especially after you saw Francis and Ganu hit some very silly takedowns on Gan with ease. Um, But what I wonder is, like, is that what if it doesn't work? What if, because, because I think the main thing with Jones' uh, takedowns is that his entries are worse. Uh, the shots are slower and they were never great shots to begin with. And when they have worked in his recent light heavyweight fights, it tended to be because the opponent was basically cornered. Um, and couldn't like get their legs, their feet or their hips back quickly enough. And then, yep. and this is a thing too, like Jones is already an awkward case for shooting, but one advantage guys with insanely long arms have is that they can, they can convert a really bad shot by just reaching out and somehow grabbing your legs when you're pretty sure you sprawled to a safe distance. Um, but like if Cyril Gaon isn't getting cornered and Jones does come in wanting to wrestle, like could this possibly be, possibly be the first time we see Jones sort of actually freak out in a fight? Like I'm thinking of Adesanya Pereira, like when you set this sort of narrow win condition, if he were to come into this fight thinking I got to out wrestle this guy, or is that unlikely? Is Jones just, uh, do you guys think Jones is just going to be perfectly happy to have a kickboxing match where he's like maybe slowly getting better? I actually do think that is pretty unlikely. Um, mm-hmm. For me, this fight is, I'm favoring Cyril Gontuin and Really, I think it's mostly about like whether he's able to do his thing for five rounds or if he kind of beats himself, uh, like exhausts himself on Jones's body or makes a mistake and ends up in a bad grappling situation. But I don't say that lightly. Like I think Jones is maybe the only person at light heavyweight and only a few exceptions at heavyweight who won't beat themselves in that way. Yeah. Uh, he just doesn't make big strategic mistakes that cost him the fight. And it sounds like a small thing, but in divisions like this, it's actually a gigantic thing. And it's one of the big reasons why he's so great and why he's been so dominant. For sure. Uh, Because everyone he fights is going to make uh, a lot of mistakes every round. And they're probably going to make at least one potentially fight-costing mistake every fight. And Jones doesn't do that. He's been hurt. He's been pressured. Uh, Reyes had him in some horrible positions. He had him uh, roughed up a little bit. And stunned and when Jones was like running away and kind of scrambling to cover up and he didn't freak out. He maintained his composure. He did his little head movement against the cage. He's always working to improve his position and never really doing anything that unnecessarily exposes him to danger. Yeah. So I definitely trust Jones to be there mentally 
unless gone just like totally uh rocks him and like puts him on bambi legs or whatever even, even then though i mean when you put it like yeah. that like the first gustafson fight the the reyes fight um even in the tiago santos fight when i think he was getting hurt by those calf kicks early you never really see like an inkling of doubt or concern on john jones's face that has yeah. always been a tremendous gift of his is that he is like psychotically poised I think yep. maybe to put the essence of what I mean is that Jones freaks out by paring back his game. He doesn't freak out by uh, like yeah. putting himself out and exposing that himself. His, his, his unwillingness to make big unforced errors is perhaps a very large part of why he has become so apparently hesitant and slow-paced. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it still means he's not out there losing the fight for himself. Yeah, I think like a, an, an analog for that kind of thing would be like um, – Dominic Cruz uh, against Cody Garbrandt is that I think, um, you know, Garbrandt starts off and essentially uh, and at that point is slaughtering Cruz about as bad as Cruz ever could be. Like, yeah. you know, as, as bad as Cruz has ever been beaten and people still talk about it and so on. But by the end, you know, Cruz has still kind of figured him out by the end of that fight. Yeah. And I think John Jones, even if he's getting destroyed all five rounds by Cyril Garn, he will be thinking, I'm just about to get his number. The whole time, he will just be thinking to himself, including, you know, if he doesn't actually really get anywhere, he'll be just thinking, I'm, I'm about to get, I'm about to figure this guy out. Yeah. Because it's always worked for him. You know, he's never dropped a fourth or a fifth round, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, like, maybe once, but certainly not a fifth. Maybe a fourth once, but... You know, he's he's always by the end of the fight been able to tell himself, "I had that guy. 100%. I had him." Um, and yeah, I think that's just how it'll work. He'll just be like, he. I think he might finally like lose track of how the fight is going. In that he'll he'll be waiting for that moment when he's got the guy for too long, and then he'll be like four rounds in the hole or something. I think that's entirely possible. Um, but yeah, I don't think he's ever, I don't, I just don't think he's going to freak out. I agree with, I agree with uh, Ryan. All right. Well, it sounds like all three of us are picking gone in a, a pretty smelly kickboxing match. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to suck so bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm not expecting, I mean, I got to say, this is one of those fights where I'm actually, uh, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Oh yeah, me too. Uh, I'm interested for sure. And I don't really mind what happens. Like, if John Jones manages to stink his way to a, yeah. um, like a, a victory in the, in the Reyes Santos mold, yeah, it will in its own way be extremely funny. Yeah, because like there'll be so many people online who'll be like, "Look, see, see, he is the best fighter ever." And, and then hopefully we look get at to this, see like this yet another absolutely horrific performance against someone who beats himself. Yeah. And um, then hopefully we get to see like it, Jones versus Tuivasa or something like that. Like that's yeah. an utterly stupid um, matchup. And you know, if he somehow uses his wrestling or actually looks good, I mean it will be a, it will be so surprising. But then also, if he just loses a stinky kickboxing match, it, that will also be funny. Like it's one of the rare fights where I just find myself looking at it and I'm like I don't know if there's a bad outcome for this fight, you know, given what it is. Um, I can see I'm, that. I'm kind of looking forward to this card, too, in that way. Like, yeah. sure, maybe the matchups aren't the most compelling or competitive, uh, but we have a rare chance to w watch a fighter really cement their status as the greatest of all time, where a win would really, truly silence all doubt. That's right. Mm -hmm. If Valentina Shevchenko beats Alexa Grasso, <laughs> her status as the greatest fighter of all time is undeniable. God damn it, Ryan. <laughs> I had the joke segue all planned out. I was going to be like, well, thank God after this stinker we get to talk about, but yours was better. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. Oh, I also, I want to, I want to just say like when I was talking about like greatest fights and so on, it was, it was fantastic how we saw like the, in the run to the Islam folk fight, um, you know, they were both talking about, you know, trailing with the best people in the world and like Craig Jones. And then there were ADCC gold medalists saying how what an insane grappler Islam is. Mm -hmm. And like in the run up to this one, John Jones is like, I've been training with beasts. I've been training with Jorgen de Castro, <laughs> Maurice Green and Walt Harris. And like Cyril Garn's like, I don't even train unless I have to. 
<laughs> yeah. Somebody pointed out in my my uh my talking about that that wonderful video clip that like doesn't Cyril Gon train with Alain Baudot? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I guess fair enough, you know, but it's that it's that Les Samurai. Yeah, Les Black Samurai. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truly one of the best nicknames in the because I don't think he's Samurai Noir. I think he's Black Samurai. Oh. So they went with yeah. the English Black, but the hilariously French spelling of Samurai. <laughs> Interesting choice. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, it does seem like John Jones could have probably, I mean, he's John Jones. Like, he probably could have got like a glory contender or something to, to help him with his kickboxing or something. Do you guys think there's any indication in that that he like, he just wants to like feel good in his camp. Is that a bad sign? Yes, it's obvious. That's obviously what he's doing, and yes, it is obviously a bad sign. That, like, yeah. why would you be padding your own camp that's supposed to get you as sharp as possible for the fight? It, but that's that is a strange feeling I get from that uh, from that collection of miscreants that he has. <laughs> his training partners. They have kind of had that problem before, weren't they? Like advertising for Jones to have heavyweight sparring partners, like just putting it out on the internet, like anyone who's big and kind of familiar with MMA come train. Yeah. Maybe they just aren't really like the kind of camp that will bring people in even when it suits them. I don't really pay too much attention to that in like week to week. So I don't know if they do it a lot, but a lot of camps probably just won't recognize that as an option they want to pursue. Yeah. But it just seems like other than Walt Harris, possibly none of those guys is going to be remotely like fighting Cyril gone. Mm-hmm. I but I mean, I saw, I saw they were, they was, they were doing a uh, thing where like John Jones was swimming to pick up bricks from the floor of a um, swimming pool or something, uh-huh. and uh, I did that in my saying, lifeguard like, training. What's that? I did that in my lifeguard training when I was fifteen. Yes, this is not very difficult. <laughs> um, the and like he was saying, you know, one of the the motto of this camp is win every time, and I was like, should that be the motto of your camp? <laughs> Should it, should it just be that, like, everything is easy for you, that you're the best at everything? <laughs> is, is that what training camps are about? Yeah, I didn't I mean, really get that from Alexander Volkanovsky. I've been doing a lot of stair walks. <laughs> Do you mean stair runs, John? No. <laughs> I've walked to the top of the stairs once. Yeah, I, it, uh, it, there is a weird feeling about that, but I don't know how meaningful it is. Again, like Cyril Gon's training partners, surely I, it's not that easy, honestly, to find good heavyweight training partners, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Um, surely his training partners aren't any better, but just knowing what kind of opponent Cyril Gaon is, it doesn't seem like the camp has really been tailored to uh, to replicate that. All right, well, um, that's it. Um, we're picking Cyril Gaon. Uh, I can't wait to be wrong. I hope it's like a, a, like Gaon and Ganu, where like I would never describe it as a good fight, but I'm going to be fascinated for every moment by just mm-hmm. how strange it is. Um, let's take a break. As Ryan already led us into, we've got Valentina Shevchenko next versus Alexa Grasso. We're uh, going to also talk about Mateusz Gamrot versus Jalen Turner, uh, another fight off the main card. And then I think we're going to jump all the way down to the prelims. Oh, Ryan wanted to say something about uh, Bo Nickel. He thinks he's handsome or something. Yeah. And then love me some Bo. we wanted to talk about uh, Ryan, especially wanted to talk about Derek Brunson versus Drikus Duplessis. So oh, all, of, all of that coming up <laughs> after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like. And in return, you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. Uh, I was I was considering doing that epic voice for a while to really set up the stakes of this. The Hold on. Hmm. How many title defenses is this? The somethingth title defense of Valentina Shevchenko. <laughs> I started to count and got tired very quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, another one. It's another Shevchenko fight. Do you think the guy who was mad that I don't love Shevchenko's fights is still a listener of the show? 
Uh, maybe. There's many people to get mad about for uh, to get mad at for not liking yeah. Shevchenko that much, though. There's, you know, there's Jack Slack. There's there's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There there is a guy who, um, boy, he's gonna he's gonna fucking just blast in his pants when he f- hears me mentioning him. The who just like posts like a four paragraph comment every other week, talking about how just like just like blood vessels in his eyes are exploding because we like said some opinion. I don't know. I can't even remember what any of the takes he was so mad about are. Just like, I don't know, man. We should try try meditation or something. Try, <laughs> you know, try to distance yourself from this a little bit. Anyway, uh, Shevchenko is fighting. She's fighting Alexa Grasso. Ryan, go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, oh, wow, you're. Really I'm gonna be it. honest. It's been a while since I watched any Alexa Grasso fights. So correct me if my assessment of her is outdated. But from what I remember, she is she's a pretty solid pocket boxer, uh, high volume. But she really lacks any kind of ancillary skills that can enforce her own distance. Uh, yeah. She's not good at tracking down an opponent who doesn't want to be in boxing range. And she's not good at uh, preventing an opponent who wants to pressure her from pressuring her. That is kind of like the absolute most typical opponent Shevchenko's game is built to feast on. Um, Grasso will want to be in the pocket doing boxing things. And she's not very good at getting herself there. Shevchenko is excellent at distance management and her whole thing is setting up a step outside of boxing range uh, to make her opponent kind of telegraph their entries and lunge onto her counters. And when they do, she'll just pivot away, reset, circle off, and then do it again. Yeah. And over time, the more Grosso gets frustrated by this, she is not having any success um, throwing combinations to take her way into range because she keeps getting countered and Shevchenko is now... Uh, like 45 degrees away from her. Uh, And eventually she gets tired of this. She starts overcommitting and rushing in more. And then Shevchenko goes from all the way out to all the way in, picks up a clinch entry and takes her down. And that is probably how the fight's going to go. That sounds about right. Yeah. I would say for Grosso, um, she, um, I, I look at her and I, and I really want her to be a more, um, a more like functionally good fighter than she is. A lot of the stuff she does looks good. Like you said, great pocket punching, pretty good counter puncher as well. Um, just sort of naturally. Like I think that just sort of ties into the, she's got a good feel for shot selection and timing when she's in punching distance. Um, and, um, but what she lacks, like so many MMA boxers or MMA strikers in general, are all of the unsexy elements of striking that actually make the sexy things work. So, like, feints <laughs> is a big one. This is a very, very common refrain for me, with reason. Um, if you watch Alexa Grasso's fight with Viviane Arojo, um, this is one of those fights which seem to be just, just endlessly prevalent at women's uh, flyweight where they essentially just keep having the same exchange over and over for 25 minutes because it was a main event. And um, this is a bad sign for Grosso in general as a fighter and for anybody who wants to fight Shevchenko is that you basically have to be striking with her to win. And you you can have a bunch of exchanges, which like you're kind of getting the better of most of them, but it was a pretty close fight. And you don't have any ways of, yeah, getting to your range without just getting countered. Like, as long as the opponent is willing to throw back when you get in, even if you hit them, you're getting hit too. Um, you don't have any ways to, like, draw them onto you so that you can set up your counters. You don't cut angles, like, with purpose. Like, she circles, but she doesn't, like, get into distance and then change angle to, like, create an opening. She doesn't faint. There's not a lot of variation in her combinations, like a not not a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ja- one, two, faint, t- uppercut. You know, there's like something thrown in there, a beat to throw off the opponent's timing or Jack Slack's favorite, the, you know, what he calls lever punching, throwing two punches off the same hand. She doesn't do a lot of like hooking off the jab. Everything tends to come on more or less the same speed and with the same amount of power. 
And so, yeah, you get a lot of good looking form on the punches, like really good for this division, honestly. Um, but yeah, like getting to the places where you can land those punches and not get hit in return, or you can continue to land those punches against a, an observant opponent. That's the problem. And yeah, that sounds like a bad problem to have against Shevchenko. I gotta be honest. And Shevchenko is especially good at this. Like Joanna can do a lot of things you're talking about. And Shevchenko yeah. is still for the most part able to just no sell her feints. Uh, Joanna would be standing at range and she'd be like, okay, I'm going to punch you. I'm going to come in now. And Shevchenko would just instinctively no, like, no, you're not, you're not coming in. I can just wait here. Yeah. Wait until you break your stance and then do my thing. Yeah. You got to so be you're not really, really good at that. You're probably not going to hit Shevchenko consistently. Right. You got to be really smooth coming in off those feints. And, and again, also mixing them into the middle of your attacks and breaking your rhythm and yeah, getting actual reactions out of Shevchenko, which you can then exploit and. Yeah, literally nobody's been able to do this. Nobody. So the only, the yeah. only other people who have tested her are, are people who test her with her wrestling, like like Santos and like Jennifer Maya at points. And uh, Grasso will wrestle if her opponent is a much worse wrestler, but um, Shuchenko is not, and she's also guaranteed much physically stronger. Yeah. Phil? Yeah, I mean, so... I mean, the other thing is that Grasso is, is, is essentially... You know, we, we've kind of said that she's not really a, a super willing wrestler. I mean, she's uh, as as a striker, she's pretty much just a boxer as well. Yeah. Which is, you know, if she's going to be attempting to overload Valentina Shevchenko's defenses, which is what everyone has to do, um, it has been broadly so far impossible to run a counter punching slow game on Valentina Shevchenko unless you are like. Two feet taller than her, and Amanda Nunez. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Other than that, she's just like she's got a very, uh, she's got a very long bladed stance. She's very front foot heavy. She's probably going to be open for the uh, like open stance body kick and the head kick. Um, she's going to be open for probably open for low kicks, and yeah, she's just it's hard to see her having the. Um, it's hard to see uh, like having any way of prizing Shevchenko's defenses open because we can say that yeah Shevchenko's primary defense is simply distance management but she's remarkably good at it yep. and uh Grasso's going to open up like one and done with uh, like uh mostly with like a single left hook or a single like dipping jab and uh, Shevchenko will simply back away. And the issue is that, like, Grasso was quite... One of her early issues as a fighter was that she was someone who couldn't quite keep her own pace that well. But now it seems like her pace has actually gone down from that. Uh, you know, rather than being able to adapt to fighting at a higher pace, she simply lowered her pace yeah. as the, as time has gone on. And it just doesn't seem like nothing about that in terms of trends where she could have gone or anything like that seems like it's likely to work against Shevchenko unless she has like some sudden breakout combination punching performance yeah. where she just starts, you know, chasing her down with like Poirier esque, like triple jabs and then combination punching her like, yeah, maybe that will happen. Maybe you, know, uh, you can have like a sudden title fight, uh, you know, coming into her own performance. But if she has, if she does have that kind of performance, I think you're more than justified in not being able to see it coming at all. Right. Yeah. And even if Grasso is able to like manage the distance and consistently get in on Shevchenko, Shevchenko is really great at snatching clinch entries from striking exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, like hypothetically, you could maybe try and throw combinations with your feet under you, keep your elbows tight, make sure you're not leading and exposing yourself to a clinch entry, uh, and that would give you a chance to like get your arms back when the guy comes tries to come in and clinch and frame off. But Shevchenko is really great at uh, like picking up clinch entries in response to specific strikes. So you'll throw a right hand and she'll like duck outside of it. And then as you retract it, her head will retract with it and she'll come up behind you and like a head and arm lock and you can't get your arm back. And now she's in a good position almost on your back and she's yeah. taking you down. And that is uh, going to happen because again, yes, 
Grasso's big weakness as a striker, as a boxer, is is the lack of feints and the lack of, or the consistency rather, of the speed and intensity of her punches. That this is a recipe for getting timed by somebody who, uh, yeah. I, I mean, we were talking before uh, in the previous segment about John Jones, like even as he is visibly declining, staying on top because he simply does not make unforced errors. Um. And I, I, in other cases, I could use this as a backhanded compliment towards Valentina, but in this specific instance, I don't. She is an incredibly disciplined fighter. Except for the head and arm throws. Well, but those work, you know. <laughs> they usually Sometimes. work. Sometimes. They'll work on Grasso. I'll give her that. They will work on Grasso. Yeah. Uh, who, who, who will herself go for head and arm throws. But yeah, Shevchenko is an incredibly disciplined fighter. She does not take risks. Um, <laughs> The uh, the relentless focus on distance management very easily goes both ways, that she is always too far away to hit until you try to adjust to that, and then suddenly she has both arms around your waist and you're airborne. Um, she just does not let the opponent hang out where they have any options to do something that isn't itself a massive gamble. Um, which is why she, you know, lost that awful fight to Nunes because Nunes was like herself content to just do like awful low kicks for 25 minutes. And yeah, this is a fight where Shevchenko is not going to, it would have, it would have required her to take a risk and go after Nunes to make something happen. Um, and she didn't. And so she lost a very tepid decision, but against everybody else who doesn't have that kind of size advantage and especially against opponents like Grasso who aren't willing or other opponents like, say, Chukagian, who aren't capable, due to various you know physical factors, of outworking her from kicking range, then it's sooner or later they just have to screw up, and that's what she's waiting for. So, yeah, I think she'll probably finish Grosso on the ground. That's my call. Yeah, that seems likely. Grosso's tough as shit. I mean, to be fair, but um, you know, so is Andrade. Yeah, that's very true. Um, uh, I'm a little concerned. Uh, I don't know if concerned is the right word, but that um, that last fight from Shevchenko mm-hmm. was not good. No. Nope. Um, just like how it was. I mean, it's the worst I've seen her grappling look at uh, at this at flyweight. Yeah, it's looked that bad before a bantamweight because women were bigger than her, and she doesn't actually have like. Mm-hmm. Tremendous takedown defense. I think she's she's such like a powerful upper body clincher that sometimes somebody just like steps behind her foot and she's like not paying attention or she's clinging on too hard and just her balance is gone. A lot yep. of a lot of a lot of the takedowns she suffers are trip takedowns. Yeah. But, um, um. But she's like she's thirty four. Yeah. And she's been fighting for an incredibly long time. Mm-hmm. Uh. So I'm actually going to think she might start slipping, and I'm obviously not going to pick Alexa Grasso. Though I'm just going to pick uh, my. This is simply my rationale for picking a, another Valentina decision. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think she probably is either declining now or due for one very soon. She started fighting full time in like 2012 ish, and had like eight fights in the ten years before that. Uh, mm-hmm. And she, like you said, she's almost 35 now. So I don't know if like women's 125 will follow the normal aging curve of fighters, but if it does, she's pretty well behind that now. Yeah, and that's not even mentioning the whole kickboxing career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like she had a, a full combat sports career basically before ever getting into MMA as a full time thing. Yeah, I mean she's been basically doing this since she was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, a young one. So yeah, I, I just think like. This, she's probably uh, gonna, yeah. If she isn't declined and she didn't look great in her last fight, then she's gonna start being it. But there's there's still like no one in the division that I would pick to beat even a declined Valentina Shevchenko. Yeah, and it's notable yeah. that it was a big, strong woman who wrestled her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was yep. that was what made her look unimpressive. That's what made her look mortal. Um, I suppose, yeah, I suppose you could say the 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 worst sign for that is that. Uh, Santos was able to get to that range consistently in the first place. But I think even that um, frequently was Shevchenko herself getting into the clinches and then finding out she wasn't just like massively stronger. Yep. 
Um, so it was just her doing, I mean, she does the same thing against literally everybody. Um, and so you, you could, you could forgive, you could be a little forgiving for thinking, for, for seeing her try to do the exact same game plan against somebody for whom the, the physical dynamic just isn't overwhelmingly in her favor. Um, yeah, that's, it doesn't seem all that pertinent to me, to the Grosso thing, uh, though I'm, I'm willing to think it might indicate the first signs of a decline. Um, okay, well, I'll still go Shevchenko by, uh, I'll, I'll take a late finish. Why not? Seems fair. Okay, that's it for, for yet another one. How many has it actually been? I owe it to Shevchenko being a, the perfect human she is to actually know. Uh, uh, until, I mean, she won. So she won it against Joanna. And in terms of defenses, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, this seven. This is going to be her eighth. Her eighth. So another one. Okay. Yep. Let's take a break. When we come back, lightweights, uh, bantamweights. No. Middleweights. <laughs> Sorry, I got excited <laughs> thinking we were talking about good divisions. There's one more bad division fight, but a very good fight to talk about in Brunson Duplessis after this. Uh, yeah, we'll be right back. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Yeah, that's going to stink. All right. Uh, well, let's just go. Um, lightweights, we're back. This is heavy hands. We're back. Uh, lightweights, Mateusz Gamrot, Jalen Turner. Strange is, fight. Is Gamrot going to be able to uh, get past the impenetrable takedown defense of Jalen Turner, <laughs> Brian? Uh, so the thing with Gamrot, I love Gamrot. He's one of my favorite fighters in MMA. And he does so many things I love to see and think are awesome. So I'm going to criticize him a bit and just know that this is coming from a place of love. Gamrot has the skill set of a transitional fighter, but he thinks he's a controlled grappler. Mm -hmm. And he could be an elite transitional fighter. He has a really comprehensive skill set for that style, but he just doesn't want to win fights that way. Um, he really seems to want to win fights only by grappling. And like he, he almost seems to disdain the idea that he has to score on the feet. Um, he ends up in a lot of uh, transitional positions where he could score really well off them. Like in the Benel Dariush fight, he would have Dariush's back or be in like a dominant clinch position and he'd break and try to strike. But when he's doing these transitional attacks, it's more, it feels more like he's trying to like dot his I's and cross his T's rather than actually committing to them. Uh, like he would have Dariush's back and throw like some piddly little hammer fist over the top of his shoulder when he could have opened up with like a jab and then a body combination. So he creates a lot of these opportunities to hit and transition, but it's like always an afterthought and not something he realizes he actually needs to do in order to win these kind of fights. His grappling, he is an incredible scrambler. Uh, he has great chain wrestling, but his initial shots leave a lot to be desired. He'll often kill his own positioning by shooting to his knees with his back hunched. And a lot of that is because he's so uncomfortable striking that he'll end up shooting too, from too far away. Um, and then once he gets guys to the ground, he is just kind of too small to keep guys on their back. Uh, there was one sequence in the Dariush fight where Dariush was like, Gamera, I think, had almost a body lock on top. And Dariush was, had a post on one of his arms and like kind of a weak butterfly hook. And Gamera was trying to break him down to the ground and force him onto his back. And Dariush, with just the power of his post and his hip, was able to stay sitting up and turn belly down. Uh, so Gamrot just can't really, he doesn't have the strength or size to do the GSP thing. And when guys are able to turn over and quad pod and try to wrestle back up, he doesn't have uh, like the folk style tactics you see guys use to ride the legs or control posts. 
mm-hmm. so he can't actually like really control guys on the ground. So it, it's kind of like his style is contradictory where he has this great transitional skill set, but he ends up mostly stalling for most of his fights uh, and putting himself in positions and working toward positions where he's not actually scoring. Uh, and I think this is why he's going to struggle a lot with a lot of top 10 lightweights. I don't know if Jalen Turner is that guy. Turner's takedown defense does leave a lot to be desired. He has decent responses when he sees a takedown coming. Uh, he can hip in and sprawl out pretty hard, but he doesn't have good late stage defense. If somebody can chain or work up to the upper body, mm-hmm. uh, he kind of falters and sometimes just kind of falls down. One thing that does worry me about for Gamrot in this fight is that by killing his momentum when he shoots, like he's not going to enter into good position uh, like with his back up and his hips in position to explode right into uh, Turner's hips. He's probably pretty likely to shoot to his knees. And Turner is massive and powerful. Yeah, so I can see down. a situation where Gamrot ends up like underneath him trying to come out the back door while Turner just pounds away in his body and does a lot of damage. Yeah. Getting shut down in that first layer uh, against somebody just the size of Jalen Turner with Jalen Turner's power could be very dangerous. Yeah, and even if he ends up completing the takedown, if he can't hold him down or do a lot of scoring work on top, which he rarely does, yeah. then Turner getting those positions could win him rounds. Like, if I were to ask you what tools Gamrot has to score with in an MMA fight under MMA scoring rules, except for his rear hand straight, what would you say? Um, but hitting enough rules. takedowns that the other guy gets tired. Mm. Yeah. That tends to be how it goes, honestly. Like, which is another ancillary, like, an, an attribute that should make him a brilliant guy to just force endless transitions because he has incredible cardio. Um, but yeah, that tends to be how a lot of the fights go. And I think that's a very insightful way of looking at it that, like, there is a, uh, there's a, like, a fundamental misunderstanding from Gamrod about how his skill set sh- should be applied. Mm-hmm. That, I think, like, he has some chops on the feet too. Like he'll do interesting things. Yeah. He can, he has a decent jab. He can feint in and out. He's actually really good at drawing uh, counters from opponents. And if he yeah, is confident he has, enough to like, I think he has a good back, natural sense of timing. Yes. Yeah. Just in general. But I think part of it is that he really lacks confidence. Like he'll draw out a lot of those committed attacks and just decide not to punish them. Yeah. I also think there's not enough. He's sort of a, uh, if Jalen Turner has solid enough first layer takedown defense and then sort of falls apart in the later stages of the chain, I think that's a technical issue for Gamrot and his striking. Because like, yeah. I think there's, there's quite likely a, a functional reason why he doesn't feel confident in, in exploiting these openings he's getting. Because he can't exactly like put together nice combinations. All of his good strikes are themselves like first layer, one move. And then back to distance. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of depth there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so not not comfortable in the pocket, not technical in the pocket. Are these connected or are they indeed one and the same problem? But um, yeah, without developing that comfort and without looking to be more aggressive. I mean, I think the point about him getting to so many positions where he could be like breaking with initiative and cracking somebody with hard strikes before they can adjust or, or reset that's a very, very good point that like is obviously a massive oversight from Gamrod himself. Getting to somebody's back, getting them against the fence, and then just throwing like a couple perfunctory strikes. And then it's like he feels the position slipping away from him. And if it were on the ground, he would follow that in an unbelievably cool scramble. But because it's on the feet and the opponent is returning to face him, he's like, uh-oh, I'm about to be in trouble. Uh, when clearly, yeah, it would be way more effective, even with his current level of striking technique, to think, I should try to land three really hard punches very quickly before getting back, because the other guy can't hit me until he's fully facing me again. Um, and he doesn't do that. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think the feeling that, that Jalen Turner's taken on defense is the end-all be-all of this fight is maybe not accurate, because uh, Gamrot just does not actually succeed in holding most people down. And Jalen Turner is huge. <laughs> so, uh, you know, getting to posts, winning scrambles by accident, um, 
God forbid, ending up like sprawled out underneath Jalen Turner and realizing like maybe you can't reach his legs to get to, to a further stage of the shot. Like these are potentially very dangerous problems, I think, for Gamrot. Uh, Tur- Turner is just, he is a beast and a very dangerous fighter and himself increasingly comfortable in transitions. That's kind of becoming his thing. In fact, largely on the feet transitions between different ranges and between, uh, boxing and, and the clinch. But, um, yeah, he, this is not a guy who does not, who fails to seize opportunities when they are presented to him, especially when he's already got contact with his opponent, knows exactly where he has to throw to hit them clean. Yeah. I mean, Turner, I think is someone with, um, he, he's just horrifically potent at this stage of his career. Um, he's, he kind of reminds me of a little bit of McGregor at 145 in that he's just enormous and he's got a great understanding of how his range works and that he doesn't actually need to hit people that hard in order to hurt them. Yeah. Um, so he's able to, like, pick up tons of like short uppercuts, little jabs, you know, it's, it's basically to wade through range against him is, inc- is just unbelievably dangerous. I think, um, I think the fact that Gamrot's got an insane gin is probably helpful. Um, I do kind of think that Gamrot, that Turner's state down defense might just be the story of this fight though. Yeah. Um, because I mean, the other thing about Gamrot is that he's been fighting really good grapplers. It's true. Um, yes, that is very uh, true. Arman Sarukian, um, Kutataladze, uh, Benil Dariush. Mm-hmm. Like not being able to continue, like get control positions on these guys, is not the damning indictment that it, it should be. Meanwhile, you know, Turner gave up a uh, like I think was it Jamie Malarkey just turned the corner and ran a double leg on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just double legged um, him smoothly. And who's the tiny little guy? Was it Matt Frivola who just, like, crushed him for two rounds? Yeah. And the thing is that uh, it's, it's possible that Turner has improved since then, but they've just given him strikers. And you haven't seen it. And as I said, like, the, the Malarkey fight wasn't actually that long ago. Yeah, well, also um, Brad Riddell took him down twice. Uh, or no, no, Brad Riddell didn't. It was Jamie Malarkey I was thinking of. You're right. yeah. yeah. Um, and so like, I do genuinely think there's a chance that just, uh, Gamrot might, Gamrot sort of single mindedness, uh, might actually work quite well for him here because he's not going to try lots of funky things on the, te- on, on the feet with a super giant, incredibly potent, um, finishing threat. He's just going to look to set up a clinch almost immediately. And then I think he's probably just going to take Jalen Turner down. Yeah, I do like a lot of what Turner does on the feet. He's a, a really good swarmer, and with Gamrot's footwork and tendency to lose positioning and back himself into the cage, if he can't consistently get takedowns uh, or at least uh, tie up enough to prevent Turner from getting space, that could be a huge problem for him, where if Gamrot's pressed to the cage, Turner will just unload with head-body combinations, mm-hmm. devastating knees, and hurting kicks. Mm-hmm. Um but part of what makes Turner such a devastating swarmer is that he uses frames really good. Uh, when opponents come in to try and clinch him and stop the bleeding, he'll extend his arms, uh, just like cross face them away mm-hmm. while he beats the shit out of them with his elbows and fists and knees. Uh, he'll do that mid exchange too. He'll throw a couple punches, frame off the face and knee them. Those are great swarming tools because they let you kind of connect ranges and keep while yeah. keeping your combination going. But they also let guys shoot underneath you onto your hips. Yeah. That's, um, I think, how the Jamie Malarkey double leg happened, where he came in and Turner went to extend his hands to frame off, and there was nothing preventing Malarkey from just getting in on the hips clean. And while Gamrot does like to shoot to his knees with a low single, if you just give him things, sometimes he'll be able to enter into a double leg in good position. Like, he, he doubled Armand Sarukian off his feet once and turned the corner on that nicely. Uh, so... He doubled Darius, I, too. Yes, he did that as well. Like, very um, very quickly into the fight, Darius was trying to pressure him, and he just hit him with a really quick reactive shot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I agree with Phil there. I think that Turner could be a problem for him. 
Um, I think I also think there's a chance that Gamrod is able to control him a lot, uh, but Turner finds a lot of damage in those like interstitial positions in the clinch or while he's on top of him, and I end yep. up scoring the fight for Turner. But <laughs> of course I do. You will. But I think Gamrot is probably his Turner's takedown defense probably doesn't hold up, uh, and Gamrot can just wrestle him. Especially Turner's bottom game, he in the Frivola fight, every time he got up, I think was from coming up on an underhook, mm-hmm. uh, and that is probably not the best way to do it against Gamrot. If you belly down and try to wrestle up, it'll he doesn't really have great tactics to keep you down, but with Turner being more comfortable playing off his back and looking for underhooks in that, I think there's a better chance of Gamrot shutting that down than somebody like Dariush or Carlos Diego Fajeda or Armand Strukian who wants to scramble with him. Yeah, these are all very good points. Um, I, I still get concerned. I mean, I, I do really like um, what I've seen out of Jalen Turner's uh, striking. I, I call that like uh, the the long clinch. When a guy will sort of find, mm-hmm. um, like just have extended hands and, and find wrist control and find collar ties and frames from much farther away than you think should really be the clinch range. But it sort of turns a boxing exchange into a clinch one where yeah. it now becomes super easy to, yeah, find the right range to time your shots because you're not guessing. You're not going off of a sense of, a sense of distance that you've built up over the preceding minutes of the fight. You're just, the, the guys in your hands hit him. Um, it also makes me think of like, uh, like George Foreman, like pre comeback George Foreman, the Sandy Sadler style George Foreman, who would just, yeah, just like muscle people around, reach out, grab their gloves, shove them backwards, um, and just bully people and know exactly where to, to place them into his power. But, um, yeah, I mean, I just did a, a scouting report for somebody where I looked at this exact same thing and was like, yeah, you can shoot under that. Um, yeah. And it's scary, you know, like Gamrot's one of these days, the dude is going to dive face first into a knee. But um, I never, ever like counting counter knees as like a really significant idea because they're so high risk, lo- uh, low reward percentage wise. The timing has to be absolutely perfect. And Gamrot, even if it's not always a great shot, it is a very quick shot, and it is exceedingly well-timed. Um, yeah, and he's just got a rock-solid chin. That, too. Yeah, that is another factor, yeah. I mean, he turned and did exactly that to Matt Frivola at one point. He just got a uh, counter knee on him as he was shooting in, and then Frivola ate it and just took him down. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, I think... Uh, the the other thing that you guys sway me with is is I, I have long thought it uh, like a serious problem for Gamrot that um, or at least not even necessarily always a problem but just a, a dynamic of uh, a factor of his style that he just can't hold anybody down he clearly wants to and he just can't so he just has to hit like a dozen takedowns every fight but um yeah they're all really good on the ground <laughs> every single yeah. one of these dudes even we phil you forgot to mention carlos diego Fajeda, like another oh yeah of course uh, like th- these are these are they not... actually did finish him on the ground k- yeah. kind of it was like yeah, a yeah. weird finish but yeah it's not something you can replicate but it was there yeah um these are all guys who are themselves exceptional scramblers and that is not jalen turner so it seems like gamrod is the pick you have to make yeah all right, well, let's yeah, see. Just as a, a final thing, what you mentioned about Turner uh, doing the like mid-range clinch, there's a lot of mid-range clinchers like that in Muay Thai. Yeah. And often they can struggle with lockers that just get inside that and body lock them. Yeah, this was like the Sanchai approach. I think that's what's going to happen here. The Sanchai approach against all the long, tall clinchers he fought is like, oh, double underhooks. Yeah. Just get inside of it. Yeah, that, that idea was introduced to me at a, uh, a seminar by, I think the guy's name was Dorian Price. Who was like an American who, you know, trained in, in Thailand a bit and was like a training partner of Matt Brown's, who was also very good at this in an MMA context, finding those, uh, clinch grips and frames from really far away. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting way of fighting. I love what Turner does with it. It's, it, it still stands out. Not a lot of MMA fighters. It seems like it should be way more natural to MMA. It is really cool to watch. Yeah, it is. But, uh, yeah, his legs are there, so <laughs> you could probably just take him down. All right, um, 
Ryan, you were desperate to say something about Bo Nickel. Phil and I begged you. We said, please, we don't care that much about Bo Nickel. And you really wanted to talk about <laughs> it. So this better be good. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about Bo. I, I didn't watch too much of his wrestling career because folk style is hard to find. And he kind of came onto the freestyle scene after I'd stopped watching as much. Uh, but from what I remember of him there, he has great leg attacks and he's also really good at upper body stuff. Um, which obviously is very, a very good base to build your MMA career off of. Uh, if you can comfortably shoot and control guys and throw guys from the clinch. Um, so far, he actually seems to be building a pretty coherent striking game, mm-hmm. which is like, he's what, a year into his career now? Mm-hmm. He's very new. Um, but he already has a basic understanding of pairing the southpaw straight with body kicks. Um, I think his second amateur fight, he finished by kind of circling the opponent into his uh, left hand, which was like a nice little bit of southpaw tactics that you usually don't see from a pure wrestler who just started in MMA and his top game there. Well, there's still openings and he leaves space where opponents can get up, but that seems to be coming along really well. Uh, he's been finishing guys with quick submissions and he also seems pretty good at like using submissions to control rather than just jumping on things. Mm-hmm. I think in his most recent Tuesday night contender series fight, uh, he hit a guillotine and used it to go to mount, and then instead of like committing to it and risking the guy rolling him, he let it go and then stabilized the position, then finished him with a triangle. Uh, and as somebody who's like who's coming over from a full wrestling career at only 27 mm-hmm. and a couple of years into their career, he has I think he has a really bright future, and I'm excited to watch this fight. Even though he's being matched with, I mean, I can't even make fun of it. The guy's a complete novice, really, if a very promising one. But he has been matched with the most nervous man in the middleweight division, in Jamie Pickett. So, pretty soft touch, I think, for Bo Nickel. Yeah, yeah. it's his first fight in the U.S. As it should want to yeah. make him look good. Yeah, I mean, my fear, of Phil and I talked about this when he got signed, was like, well, the UFC is just not organized to like manage prospects' careers. They just get fucking crushed sooner or later and usually sooner but uh at least um as of now it does look like they are maybe prepared to at least give him a little while to develop as a fighter they should yeah i mean i think it's just yeah it's it's not the place for it i think either he does either he does very well and then probably burns out super quickly um or uh or yeah he just starts picking up injuries um, I think both, both him and who's that weird like, uh, like uh, that Robbie Lawler Dan Henderson clone that they've got. He's, he's like oh yeah, I know you're talking about. years old. Yeah. Oh like they, oh yeah they, yeah. they mixed up their DNA and then. Uh, Raul and then, Rosas is that his name? Yeah yeah him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just not a good idea. No, like, I absolutely agree. even. Even Aaron Pico in Bell- you know, that was Bellator, which yeah. isn't as. Uh, they gave him like a uh, fifty, a guy with fifteen fights or something in his first fight, didn't mm-hmm. they? Mm-hmm. And he just got wrecked immediately. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, the UFC so- um, either when they sign really early prospects who haven't had the normal development track, it seems like they either they go from signing complete no hopers who are not athletic and not particularly good at anything that their guy will just blow up easily. And once he's done enough of that, he levels up to fighting actual UFC fighters, and they're not ready for that. They don't have nope. that middle ground of like, okay, this guy, he's not great, but he's not going to beat himself, and he's pretty athletic. That a lot of regional organizations will put prospects against. Mm-hmm. And those are the kinds of guys you see them win, and often pretty dominantly, but they struggle a bit. They can't get to their first takedown, uh, or they beat him up a bit in the first round, and the guy's still there, and they they have to figure out how to adjust to that, but the UFC doesn't do that, and that really hurts their ability to develop prospects. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah, my my worry is that like yeah, I mean Bo is going to have he's going to be able to hold on to the uh, experience of having zero pushback for quite some time, um, but then when he does, it's still going to be much too early. 
that's the the general issue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's something to the fact of coming from an actual, like, a, com- a competitive combat sports career um, is something, you know. But, um, yeah, I, I, all the same, it seems very unlikely he's going to lose to Jamie Pickett. So, mm-hmm. for now. Oh, yeah, he's going to kill this guy. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we're already way long. I mean, if, maybe this will be bonus material. Um, who knows? Maybe it'll just be an hour and 45 minute episode. But we have to talk about the middleweights. I'm sorry, Ryan. <laughs> we have to talk about Derek Brunson and Drikas Duplessis. This, I think, is this is a fight made for like me and Phil. Like if we it's thought so good, <laughs> the middleweight <laughs> division had lost some of its charm in the years since we used to do our uh, our League of Extraordinary Journeymen series. Then this is like this is what middleweight is all about, baby. This is a Duplessis rip. might be the most middleweight fighter oh, who ever middleweighted. Nobody tries harder than Drikas Duplessis. Tries so hard. He tries so hard. <laughs> <laughs> He's really out there going for it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think you could say the same for Derek Brunson. Actually, like this is kind of a, a meeting of the minds here. These are both guys who really should be lauded for their effort. They both hit really hard. And they they both just seem like like they really are not that good at MMA. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, Phil. Do you have any? <laughs> you and I have been looking forward to this one since we noticed it on the undercard. Here, do you have a a preliminary feeling on how this one actually shakes out? Um, I think Derek Brunson. He's been through. He's been he's been through so many transformations. Yeah. That he can look at someone who's uh, he can look at someone who's just like in coate effort, uh-huh. like Drikas Duplessis, and he can be like, "I know what it was like to be you once, young grasshopper," or something <laughs> like you. No one, I mean, no one can actually know what it's like to be Drikas Duplessis. <laughs> no, uh, like, Drikas Duplessis very well, well might not know what it's like. Yeah. Uh, well, that is the thing about Drikas is I think he does, actually. That is the staggering thing that really sets him apart from Derek is Derek is plainly having a miserable time mm-hmm. when he's fighting. Drikas looks like a guy who should be having a miserable time, but then, like, the fight ends and he's like, uh, yeah, that uh, sequence in uh, round two was really interesting. It's like, how do you even remember that? You were, like, beat red <laughs> three minutes into the fight. You're dripping sweat. You're gasping for breath. <laughs> you look like you're panicking all the time. But he is, by all appearances, a very clear-headed fighter, which just makes him all the more fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, because like, I think the, the, the closest analog to like Drikas Duplessis is like Michael Chandler, um, as someone who just like is on maximum effort the entire time. Yeah. But Michael Chandler, obviously, like, you know, it gets away from him. He destroys himself. Yeah, and you know, and and he he fouls and he doesn't remember and like he's just a uh, yeah, it, it overwhelms him. But Trikas every time he hurts somebody, is, he almost gets himself knocked out. Yeah, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like he, but like Drikas Duplessis somehow is able to to ride the wave of his his own mindlessness. It's completely bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Um, the real Drikas yeah, I mean, is like piloting the the flesh golem known as Drikas Duplessis, just like safely situated inside his skull. Mm-hmm. Like he doesn't feel threatened by all of the incredibly dangerous shit that's happening in his fights. It's inexplicable. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like uh, Derek Brunson has always been pretty good at just like beating up other wild men. Yeah. Like I mean, going back to say. Uh... Uh, rest in peace, uh, Elias Theodoru. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Ian Heinish, one of the closest thing, another another like yeah. uh, person from the general uh, du- Chandler effort clade. Duplessis Mark One. Um, yeah, and these were and yeah, essentially he's. I mean, uh, Brunson has a genuine like wrestling skill set. Um, he now has a striking game which has things that he wants to do that aren't just, you know, bomb rushing people and going mad. Mm-hmm. Um, he's still quite a good clinch fighter. He's got like, still got quite a good single color tie um, and can uh, <laughs> like, uh, 
uh, kick a bit, and yeah, he, he's I mean, and he's he's basically fairly comfortable with all these things that he wants to do, and he doesn't tire himself out. Um, <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, laughing. I'm just watching Drinkus Duplessy fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching his fight with Till. It's so deeply funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you say you say Derek Brunson's a better wrestler, but did you see those takedowns he hit on Darren Till? <laughs> Pretty good. I think those would have worked on somebody not named Darren Till. Yeah, that's kind of uh, my feeling too. Is that like Derek Brunson does seem to have an initial advantage. Uh, the question for me really is: is do, can he sit on that advantage for the whole fight? Can he consistently yeah. out wrestle Drakus Duplessis? Um, when like both of them are going to get tired, but Duplessis is just way happier being tired. Because like Derek was doing pretty good against Jared Cannonier, another like strong maniac of a slightly different mold um and like even when things first started to go downhill he was like coming up with good responses he was countering he was getting to his wrestling positions and uh but he just couldn't hold it together Mm -hmm. that is a Derek brunson problem that duplessis inexplicably does not have yeah no you make you make a good point uh that is the first time that i've seen like Derek brunson really seriously panicking in a while yeah and he got tired real fast yeah and it was because a big like, part of that is that cannoneer is a legitimate athlete he's very big and strong at the weight and like yes if you're either not a good athlete not a great athlete or you don't have strong meat and potatoes takedown defense brunson is just gonna do his thing he's gonna swim into the clinch uh he's gonna grab you and drag you down and you're not gonna be able to get him off you drigus duplessis He's a good athlete. He's big and strong. Uh, he's hard to move in the clinch. Yeah. I, re- I really think this fight comes down to whether his like his takedown defense is skilled enough to leverage that athleticism. And I, I really don't know at all. I don't know. He hasn't really faced any good wrestlers yet. Like any good yeah. offensive wrestlers. Yeah, nothing about him makes him look like he's the he's as physically potent as Jared Cannonier. But it's just the fact, like, can he make up for that with just sheer effort? And but that's the thing is that every time he's been able to do that. Yeah. I mean, the till fight was <laughs> the till fight was incredibly easy to call and very funny to watch. Very like, funny. It's just like this is so obviously what's going to happen. This guy's going to try super hard to beat Darren Till, and Darren Till's going to be like, "Oh, my my approach of like doing one or two things is surely going to work against this absolute moron." And then he's going to he's going to be unbelievably horrified and give up when he realizes yeah. it doesn't. It did work a um, lot. <laughs> it worked a lot, especially after the first round when Duplessis was just like. Yeah, gasping like a landed fish and just like f- flapping around on the outside. And Darren Till was like lighting him up with straight punches. He just didn't go away. And even by the end of that round, he was starting to counter Till and threaten him with takedowns again. Mm-hmm. Uh, he took Darren Till down six times, according to the stats. That is. Um, yeah, I mean, also getting absolutely knackered fighting Darren Till. Is also not really. Yeah, it doesn't matter what uh, the opponent does. The, giving me the the vibes that he's going to be able to replicate what Jared Cannonier can. It doesn't. It's completely irrelevant can, what the opponent does. Duplessis exhausts himself. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> so how how to call this fight? <laughs> I, I've just I've got I've got a big front and like yeah. Duplessis going to tire himself. Like Jared Cannonier just doesn't get tired. Like I said, he's so physically overwhelming. Yeah. Whereas, uh, uh, like, uh, Drikas Duplessis can just push himself beyond the limits of flesh. He but almost, he comes back. I'm not though. sure if that's going to help that much when he's on the bottom. <laughs> he comes um, back though. That is the troubling thing. That like all the other guys Brunson beats um, are either yeah like way physically outmatched. They have no wrestling game. Or they destroy themselves, like Edmund Shabazian. Um, or Darren Till. And um, who actually sort of meets all of those categories, <laughs> actually, <laughs> now that I think about it. Can't wrestle, destroys himself. I guess is maybe kind of physical. 
uh, yeah, I, I just wonder, like, Derek, Derek's going to get tired too. Like he's not, he's not a guy who, even when he's out wrestling people, it's like zero effort. Like you can think of him against like Elias Theodoro, for example. And he's just like clinging to his leg and like gasping for breath, like holding him desperately against the fence. And this is a very unthreatening Elias, you know, guy who's really just when he gets back to space, wants to do weird stuff and isn't really hurting anybody. Uh, I just wonder what happens if like they both just get exhausted. And obviously, Drikas has been losing the entire fight because probably he's getting out wrestled. And then Derek is just like stumbling around with his knees locked out and his mouth open. Like, and Drikas is just doing like three spinning attacks in a row. At him. <laughs> it seems like I mean, uh, what you're describing to me is magic, Connor. That's what's That's... happening in that moment. I can't explain Drikas. You know, by scientific terms, I think it is magic. I, I mean, I would, I would, in some ways, you know, I love Derek Brunson. I would love to see Drake oh, yeah. Duplassi, you know, just make it all the way to a title fight and then just get absolutely destroyed by Alex Pereira that would be until he just, yeah. like, Pereira just finally freaks out at the man who just gets crushed by his hardest shots the entire time and looks like he's <laughs> on the verge of a heart attack, <laughs> just will not stop coming. <laughs> I'm I'm 100% here for Drikas Duplassi, middleweight champion. Yeah. I would really like to see Derek win. I think that's why I'm um I'm hesitating to pick him cuz I I love Derek Brunson. I really do. Um he's my favorite absolute mess. Um I think I'll yeah, I'll take Derek. Drikas just can't actually be a very good wrestler. He doesn't <laughs> look like he actually is. He got took, taken down immediately by Brad Tavares, right? Mm, I don't think so. Did he? I thought so. Maybe. Yeah. Like instantly. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> that rocks. Um, yeah. But I don't know, man. Also, Tavar is another great one where like, yeah, once you get back to space and he's just like timid and Drake is just like throwing the worst punches you've ever seen, but. <laughs> It doesn't matter. He I just... think I think Drikas was trying to like suplex him, and then just you know, yeah, and then just it just he just ends up falling over and like ending up in like half guard. <laughs> he just goes Rah! and then just falls backwards with uh, <laughs> with uh, Brad on top of him. Tremendous. That's He's great. It. He really is. Uh, well, Ryan, you got a pick. <laughs> Man, I I kind of want to pick Drikas. Like, there's a lot of things I think are going in his favor. Um, he does have the athleticism to not just get flattened, like a lot of Brunson's opponents do. Brunson is 39 years old. Yeah. And he's been fighting for a long time. So I do expect him to hit a sharp cliff pretty recently, especially his last good performance was in 2021 against Darren Till. But. I just haven't seen any defensive wrestling out of Duplessis, and I can't pick a guy to beat Derek Brunson if I haven't seen that. Yeah. So reluctantly, with absolutely no confidence at all, I'm going to pick Derek Brunson. <laughs> with dread in your heart that we made you talk about this fight. <laughs> as soon as I felt the words leave my mouth, I, I knew Duplessis is going to finish him. Phil, I just saw that <laughs> takedown you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> words cannot describe how funny that exchange is <laughs> he just grabs him and just falls over backwards on purpose i know it's not a sacrifice throw it's not a suplex it's, it's just falling over backwards oh, oh my god yeah um i'm gonna i'm gonna take derek just because I, I like him more you know, out of mm -hmm. optimism, and he definitely is going to be able to out wrestle Drikas, but I really foresee a collapse at some point for Derek, and I just think Drikas has proven he's he's better equipped to uh, to handle uh, both fighters collapsing into absolute mayhem. All right, uh, Phil, you're taking Derek as well. Yep. All right. Let's make it unanimous. We'll God, he see. throws himself clean onto his back, yes. too. He doesn't even, like, brace yes. it at all. Yes. <laughs> there's no arch. He pancakes himself. There's it's no, so great. There's no arch. There's no twist. He's, it's completely <laughs> unclear what he thought was going to happen. So he's trying to do a lat drop, but forgot the lat. <laughs> <laughs> 
So good. All right. Well, that is um, all that we can cover from UFC 285. We want to thank Ryan Wagner again for joining us. Do you like that, Ryan? I went with the North German Trildar this time instead of the <laughs> sound that Phil and I love so much. That was perfect. Thank you, Connor. You're very welcome. Um, anything you'd like to plug before we let you go? What should, uh, what's your recent stuff people should check out? Um, I haven't done much recent stuff, but check out the fight site at fightsite.com. Uh, me and a bunch of my colleagues from out the MMA media world write in depth, um, anal- analytical articles, uh, about once every four months or so. So if you like that kind of content and you don't need any kind of schedule, check us out. Follow me on Twitter at Ryan Awag Sistema, R Y A N A W A G S Y S T E M A. Great. And for my plug, I will say don't check out the fight site. That's my plug. For you. <laughs> uh, find Phil and I on Twitter as well at Evil Greg Jackson, at Boxing Bush. Check out our Patreon. Um, Yep, that's it. We will talk to you after UFC 285. I'm pretty sure the following card is not good. Oh, no, it's Jan Duwalish Willie. Oh, that's cool. Ooh, okay. We will have um, guaranteed, then, a, a bonus episode coming to the Patreon for you next week because there is going to be too much for us to cover, even if 285 delivers a lot of stinkers. They will, as we've said, be interesting stinkers. That will be uh, fun to talk about. So we'll be back next week, and until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. You know, like most beginners, when they're trying to do like upper body throws, the problem is that they don't commit enough. Uh, like <laughs> you're trying to show somebody to do a lat drop and he just can't he won't hit in hard enough he won't trust himself to really arch his back and like throw the guy Duplessis had all the commitment and absolutely not a single thing else <laughs> <laughs> oh man he's the goat yeah he is quite possibly half goat it's uh, the, yeah. can't, it can't be purely human DNA in that man <laughs>